Well, first I want to introduce Sergeant Dave Dixon. Uh, I gave you the spelling earlier. Uh, he's the sergeant that runs the uh, persons unit and is responsible for why we're here today. So Dave, do you want to introduce your, your team? Uh, this is Deputy Gus Moore. He's the lead detective on the case. Uh, Deputy Pat Smith, he's co-lead. And Deputy Rick Gonzalez. And I gave all their spellings uh, earlier so they would have that. Okay. So I'll start this off uh, kind of where we left off with the with the last uh, press conference. And uh, there was, we mentioned at the last uh, press conference, this was uh, a very difficult case. This is the kind of case that uh, fear and nightmares are made of, and uh, I think you'll understand why when, when I finish. The, we called you out here last to get the composite, and we had a, a, a good composite, and while we were working on that composite, we also had um, the investigators that were talking to uh, the family that lives at the house and in any investigation you go through who's been at the house who wh what are the connections and through those connections uh, we learned that there was a 16 year old uh, student of redwood um, continuation school who had done some yard work uh, and he was distantly related to one of the family, correct? Yes, he was uh, distantly related to, to Mike Rice. Yes, very distantly related. But he had done some work around the house. Uh, when his name uh, came forward and we looked at his picture and looked at the composite, they were remarkably similar. Uh, so at that point we started going toward that direction. When the composite aired on all the TV and in the Castro Valley Forum and in the different newspapers, uh, we had a relative of this same 16-year-old call investigators and say they believe that this composite looked an awful lot like their relative. So now we had two people saying uh, that, or two different entities pointing to the same person, this 16-year-old. So armed with that information, we wanted to get the photo of that 16-year-old uh, to our eyewitness that gave us the composite. As things go in investigations, this witness uh, on the morning that he saw this person leaving the car was moving. And he wasn't moving locally, he was moving back east to the east coast. So we made contact with him and he at the time was in Tennessee. So uh, Sheriff Ahern uh, granted permission to have that person stop his travels. We got a hotel room for him and flew out two detectives to Tennessee uh, to do a photo lineup with him because we wanted to make sure of what our suspicions were. So the two detectives flew out to Tennessee, they put the photo in what is called a photo lineup and the person said that's the one and pointed to the person that we believe was our suspect. With that information, uh, a warrant was uh, issued by a judge and the 16 year old, and I'll give you his name, we're not going to release this photo, he is Christian Birdsall, he is 16 years old. He at the time was living uh, on Rex Road in Hayward with an 18 year old and that 18 year old's father. Uh, Mr. Birdsall was taken into custody at the school and at that very same time uh, they served a search warrant on his residence uh, on Rex Road in Hayward. Uh, when the deputies went in to do that search warrant, they uh, detained uh, the 18-year-old and his father. They were sitting there. The father was very upset that the sheriff's office was now uh, in their house serving a search warrant and basically telling the kid what's going on. He was asking him what's going on, what, what, what are you doing. If you, got, if you did anything, you need to come clean. And the kid turned and looked at his father and said, we killed someone. At that point, uh, although he was a person we were looking at, uh, he, we weren't sure of his connection. At that point, we were pretty sure of his connection. So he was uh, taken into custody along with the 16-year-old. And that 18-year-old's name is, and I'll get it through his photo, is uh, Cody Nakosha. This is what nightmares are made of, um, of what these two and I'll use the term loosely, people did to this woman. 
On Wednesday, they went to the house uh, knowing that the uh, Mr. Rice was gone and out of town, and their intent was to go in and burglarize the house and take valuables. They waited uh, on the property hiding uh, for uh, Miss Lashley to leave. She never left. So at some point, they concocted a plan that they were going to go inside the, the home. Uh, the 16-year-old Mr. Birdsall uh, knocked or rang the doorbell and she answered. She's familiar with him. Uh, he went inside, asked if he could do some more work around the house. She agreed. Uh, but what he actually did was open the back door so that the 18-year-old could come in the house. The 18-year-old came into the house. He hid in the house. Uh, and um, at some point uh, when Miss Latchley was nearby, he jumped out and grabbed her. Uh, from behind, put her in a stranglehold, um, and strangled her to where she fell on the ground. Now, in the law enforcement world, we we know what is called a carotid hold. You basically cut the carotid artery off, and it'll make you pass out. It doesn't necessarily kill you. Um, and that's what happened in this case. Uh, the, the two then went through the house. They took valuables, and I will tell you, they took guns. They took money and they took jewelry uh, and during while, while they were doing this uh, Miss Latchley uh, started making noises she was she was not dead at that point and the two of them took a rope and uh, together they strangled her to death. Uh, the, the two finished off their burglary taking the money guns and jewelry uh, and they took her car and they went and had lunch. After they had lunch, they met up with some friends, uh, and later on that evening, they realized that there was a dead body in this home, and they may have left some evidence behind, so they went back to San Carlos Avenue uh, with gasoline cans. They both uh, spread gasoline through the house. They both uh, soaked her body in gasoline. They went to the front door, lit a match, threw it in. The house went up in flames, they closed the door, took off in her car, and left for the night. They, we believe they went to their home, uh, and in the morning, the 16-year-old went to school. He went to first period at Redwood Continuation, thought, and driving the car, by the way, to the school. Went to school, uh, thought after first period that maybe he shouldn't be in that car any longer. Uh, between periods, drove the car up to where it was found on Brookdale, Brookdale Avenue and ran back to school. That's when our witness saw him. Uh, unfortunately for him, he was late to school, so he uh, got stopped by the campus people and he had to sign in, which gave us uh, some evidence that he was uh, not where he was supposed to be during the school day. Um, I think that pretty much covers it um, and then we, we go on to what I told you before about getting the idea of the help that we got from the media it was tremendous um, you know you, you're we've been doing this a long time collectively and you, and you see different things that come along this one is really tough there's uh, some absolute evil out there and these two are evil uh, to do something like this questions so what time in the afternoon that he first approached the house. They they actually arrived at the house. Michael, oh, please. Okay. Go ahead, Dave. The two suspects arrived at the house on the morning of, of the homicide at eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, they stayed on the premises until uh, between twelve and one, uh, devising their plan, hoping that uh, our victim would leave the house. When she didn't leave the house is when they uh, put their plan into place and knocked on the front door under the ruse that uh, Chris was there to do some more with God work there. Is it fair to say that you will bring this case to the DA in hopes of having him charged as an adult? As we speak right now, uh, uh, my lieutenant, Lieutenant Colby Stata, is at the uh, district attorney's office meeting with the DA's office, and it is our understanding that the DA is going to charge Mr. Bursaw as an adult in this case. Can you talk a little bit about, <coughs> excuse me, about motivation? I mean, what was the what was the motivation behind this? I mean, was it just simply to rob and to kill her? I mean, what, what was behind it? I'm going to let Gus answer that question. 
uh, interviews with both suspects indicate that the motivation was guns and the money, valuables inside the home. And did they say what they were going to do with the guns or the money? Uh, well, they sold some of those guns that were taken from the residents. And what type of guns are we talking about? Uh, handguns and rifles. In Multiple. The, I mean, how many? Can you, like six, five, two? Approximately uh, between six and nine. I, can I jump in there, too, on that? That's one part of the story I, I left out. Some of those guns and items from the home were actually uh, hidden by the suspects uh, in Carlos B. Park in Hayward. Uh, and after uh, speaking with them, we were led to those items in Carlos B. Park, and we've since recovered them. But they were actually uh, covered with brush in a very remote area of Carlos B. Park, which is very close uh, to the Rex Road. Pat, if you can tell them what guns that you guys recovered from Carlos B. Uh, we recovered uh, several rifles. I believe uh, there was a total of uh, five rifles and two handguns uh, located at that location. Are the guns per se registered to Mr. Rice and or Ms. Lashley or both? As far as the registration of the guns, all of the guns uh, belonged to Mr. Rice. Oh. And do you know, I know it might be kind of unclear, but do we know the nature of the very, very distant relationship between Mr. Rice and uh, Birdsall? I you say there's no, there is no blood relation, but there is a relation, uh, a distant relation through the, through the family of Mr. Rice. A distant, a distant blood relation or a distant acquaintance type relationship? I explained it to him. Man. Yeah, what does that mean? Uh, <laughs> this was, uh, Mr. Rice uh, has a sibling um, that, had a, a, a child, um, or excuse me, is a sibling uh, who uh, his wife had a child through a different father, and she is the mother of Christian Verso. When I said distant relations, I meant distant so relations. So it's, uh, it's if you want to call it kind of a step nephew, if you will. Relation by marriage, basically. Yes. They're not married. But no, I mean, that's how he's part of the family. Yeah. To, to Mr. Rice, yeah, but not no, not, not Mr. Rice, but that's, yeah. Can anyone, I know it's probably a difficult subject, but uh, anyone comment about how Mr. Rice is handling this? I mean, to have his, I guess, most of his wife gone, and, and then somebody he apparently trusted to be the one who... Mr. Mr. Rice is absolutely devastated uh, by, this, by this situation. Um, when uh, Detective... Uh, Moore and I spoke with him on yesterday morning. He, he just happened to call uh, right when we were in the midst of, uh, of, of arresting our suspect and getting ready to do interviews. I spoke with him on the phone and I gave him the news that we had made an arrest of two su suspects in this incident and he, and he broke down and he started crying. Uh, Detective Moore spoke with him later in the evening uh, to give him some of the more intimate details of what, we, um, what our investigation had revealed because we didn't want him hearing on the news for the first time what it is that we're revealing to you guys right now. So we made him and, and, and uh, our victim's daughter, we spoke with both of them and, and made them fully aware of what we was going to disclose to today during this press conference. About other family members she left behind, she had a daughter. Were, were there other family members, Gus? Uh, yes, uh, the daughter. Uh, some nieces that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. uh, a sister that lives uh, in the valley as well. Mm -hmm. Can you speak? And I know we might have to be careful with the Julie, although he might be charged, likely to be charged as an adult. Any PFN or background as far as uh, criminal history for either subject? The, uh, the juvenile uh, has been arrested before uh, for theft, uh, was not booked. And the uh, not aware of Cody, believe that the adult has no criminal history. <clears throat> and we have confessions from both of the individuals. Uh, both subjects were, were cooperative with investigators. We don't we don't use the term confession. And just to confirm, uh, follow up on the indication they they apparently planned this. I mean they knew. Mr. Rice was going to be gone, so they, they had kind of inside information in fact, and they, they planned it for when he wouldn't be around? Clearly, clearly it was planned. Yeah. Uh, the, the initial target, uh, there was an interest in the guns. And um, 
Uh, Christopher was aware that there was guns in the house uh, because Mr. Rice had told him that uh, when he returned from his trip, he was going to take him shooting because Christopher had expressed an interest in possibly joining the Marines. Um, so um, Mr. Rice told Christopher that when he returned from his trip that uh, he would take him shooting and that made Christopher aware that there was guns in the house and he took the opportunity uh, to, to, to go and commit this crime while Mr. Rice was gone. It's Christian. So how Christian, I'm sorry, Christian. How, did, they, did they explain to you how this turned from them just trying to go in and take some stuff to actually killing her? Was it because she put up a fight or...? Um, when they made the decision to go in the house, after waiting outside for that period of time, anywhere from four to five hours, when they made the decision to go in the house, they had made the decision to go in and kill her. And you said that after they strangled her, took the merchandise, took the, the guns and the jewelry and whatever, they left. Did they leave in the black Volvo? Yes, they did. And you said they went and had lunch? They went and had lunch, yes. At can a local restaurant. Can you say which restaurant if you have them? No, we want to disclose the restaurant. It's, it's a local Castorado restaurant. What's the relationship between the two suspects again? They are current uh, roommates, or they were. They're not roommates anymore because one is in Juvenile Hall and one is in Santa Rita. Um, <laughs> Christian, uh, his family had gone through uh, some financial difficulties and they had lost their place of residence. Mom is currently living with uh, Mr. Rice's uh, brother, which is the connection to the two families. And um, Christian was living with uh, with Cody over at the Rex address. How do you explain this amount of violence shown by kids this age? And did this have an impact on the officers responding as well and those involved? Absolutely. Uh, I've been doing this for 29 years and I have most of my career has been spent uh, working with juveniles I was a school, former school resource officer and this is <coughs> the most callous crime that I've, I've ever been associated with as far as the impact that is taken on 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 this agency we have had probably 20 in the, in the neighborhood of 20 investigators from the, from the time that we responded to that house on uh, last Thursday, we have had 20 investigators work on this investigation nonstop. That's how dedicated we were to bringing these, these two uh, guys to justice. The people you see standing up here have, have been working 16, 18 hour days, uh, uh, but this is what we do, especially when we have a crime of this nature and we we go to work for the families, the survivors. And when we met with Mike Rice and we told him we're going to find the people that did this, and, and we were able to call him yesterday morning and tell him that, that we fulfilled our promise to him that we would find these people and bring them to justice. But what does it say about the state of mind of these kids to you? I, I can't speak to that. Let me get the timeline correct. About 1 o'clock they went in the house. Be between 12 and between 1. Between 12 and 1 they went in the house. Yes. They strangled her approximately within 20 minutes of being in the house. So some, again, between 12 and 1, between 12 and 1.30, they strangled her. They robbed the house, they left, they went and they had lunch. When did they return? That night. They returned that night sometime about 10.30. When did they leave? Uh, which, which time? After they committed the crime, what time did they leave? They asked, they, they, we believe that they left the house sometime around 5 o'clock. Uh, after the murder, they left about 5 in the afternoon, uh, went and had lunch, uh, then drove out to San Ramon, to Pleasanton, and then they returned to the house somewhere around 10.30, uh, maybe a little later. But we believe they left the house the second time after setting the fire uh, sometime shortly, shortly, before midnight. shortly before midnight. And that's when the fire got the call. So and the fire got the call about uh, 20 minutes, 20 minutes later. I guess they had a late lunch, huh? 5 p.m. Yes. And uh, again, with the fire, the fire uh, fighters notice the accelerant apparently. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, firefighters from 
And we also have arson investigators. We called our arson investigators out, and, and they immediately noticed the accelerant. Yeah. Do you have an estimate for how much money was taken from the house? Uh, we believe um, Chris, Christian estimates that his net was $800 and estimates that Cody's net was $800. But we believe that the, the, the numbers are higher than that. Can you say, uh, Sergeant, if the muddy jewelry guns were located, let's say, in a gun safe, uh, safe, what part of the home were they, these items located? At the time they were taken? Right. Uh, most of the, uh, most of the uh, valuables uh, were obtained uh, from Mr. Uh, Rice's bedroom. Uh, follow up with that was it, were they in the, were they in the safe though or were they just in a, in a drawer or anything like that? Uh, there were some items that that were in a safe. I don't want to get into too too many specifics, but there was some items taken <coughs> from a safe. Okay. Uh, Sergeant, what about the guns? Uh, were they taken into custody yesterday? Yes. They're doing court on Monday, I heard, or is that or depending when they assuming they get charged? You get two different courts. We're talking about two. Sounds like Monday. I'm gratifying you to get two guys like this in custody. It's got to, got to feel pretty good about this one. I mean, it's a horrible crime, but you guys got to be really I'm going to let uh, Sergeant Dixon answer that, but, but just to give a little precursor to this. When you think about this case, this woman's in the sanctity of her own home. She's uh, violated by a person that she knows, she trusts. Um, I thought these, these two men, young men, commit an absolutely despicable act. Uh, to murder her, uh, and then to return hours later to set her body on fire. It's just a despicable act. That's, that's the best word I can think of to describe it. And their thought process is hard to answer. Um, why two teenagers would do something like this, it's just it's beyond the imagination. But I can tell you this is exactly why um, we have a state prison system, and hopefully they'll be there for a long time. They Did they express any remorse at all to investigators when they were... Let, let me answer his question first. As, as far as gratifying, um, each of us standing up here, we took an oath uh, to the state of California, to the citizens of Alameda County, to go out and protect, uh, serve and protect. So we were doing our job. Uh, when we got the call last week, we went into action, and we were doing our job. So. Um, we learned that there was two people in our society, as J.D. had just said, who did not need to be in society. Uh, jails are built for a reason and some people need to be there, and this is definitely two guys who do not need to be in the midst of society. During your interviews? We're, we're not, we can't comment on that. Who, who did the physical strangling of, was, was I'm sorry, sorry just to clarify, was it the 18-year-old or the 16-year-old? And Who's the person that put the rope around her neck? We're, we're not going to get specific. They, they both did. They both did it. Okay. They both did this. Okay. So in other words, they both would, uh, depending on what the DA decides, they both could face murder charges. They have both been charged. Yeah, with murder. arrested for murder. Yeah. No, they've been charged. As yeah. we speak right yeah. now, like I said, my 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 lieutenant Kobe stays up, went to the DA's office this morning, and it's my understanding that they have both it's been charged with murder.